In the final episode of our Galle Gari Transfrontier Park adventure, we spend our last remaining nights at Tuerefiren, the South African side of the park. We started our journey in the Botswana side, Mabua Sehube, and ventured to the most southern point of the park. Thus far, we have had some incredible sightings. My name is Will Janssen from World of Africa Adventures. We do bespoke safaris focusing on photography. We also do launches for, for the Toyota brand. And we very often also look at new environments, new places where we can actually create memories, like we are memory smiths. We were also joined by Lorraine Doyle, a conservationist. The reason behind coming on this trip was that Ironman was very keen to start incorporating um, a conservation and ecological element into their 4x4 trips. Uh, and so that's essentially my role on this trip is to perhaps interpret um, a lot of the stuff that we see. First thing in the morning, we went on a game drive and one of the usual sightings you get in these areas are sociable weaver nests. Sociable weavers build these massive nests. So it's built by a large colony of birds and, but each one has its own little apartment, if you will. And essentially they will lay their eggs in there, the chicks um, will be raised in there. But other uh, creatures will actually go in there. So pygmy falcons um, have been known to actually even roost inside them. Um, but things like Cape Cobras um, are not averse to going up inside the, the nest um, and then they'll take out um, little chicks um, and eggs. So yeah, I guess this whole system is a food source for also a bunch of critters. Blue wildebeest, again another animal that covers a huge landscape. So you'll see them from anywhere from the Serengeti um, in East Africa all the way down the east into the low felt of South Africa um, and then all the way up into these arid environments. So again, another generalist. They, however, um, are more water dependent. So they do require access to um, freestanding water in order to survive, um, but not in the quantities that something like a buffalo does. Um, so buffalo in these arid landscapes do not basically survive um, because they need to drink absolutely every day. Um, so whereas your wildebeest don't. Um, the wildebeest, a little bit like red hartebeest, um, which also occur in these landscapes, have this really strange shape to them. So the front is quite a lot taller than the back. Um, you see it in hyenas as well. And that's actually an adaptation to being able to cover long distances to just, it's, um, it's an ergonomic design for running over long distances. Um, so again, adapted to literally following the rain. I mean, that's what happens when, they, when the wildebeest migrate. Um, they're actually following the rain. Um, and so, yeah, that's uh, one of the physical adaptations. Like a lot of these animals, they don't actually need to drink free water. They will do so happily if it's available, but they can get enough moisture from things like sama melons, gemsbok cucumbers. Uh, gemsbok will also eat um, at night, so when the moisture content um, of the plant actually increases. And if you look at a gemsbok, it's got springbok are the same, they've got these white bellies. Uh, and that's designed to basically be able to reflect heat that's coming up from the, the hot sand, reflects that heat back. Um, panting or sweating as a means of cooling is something that uh, desert adapted animals will try and avoid because it's obviously water loss. Um, and so Kremsbach can actually allow their temperatures to reach what would to other mammals be a le almost lethal level but they have this system um, within their kind of muzzle um, called a rec mirabilis. And what that is, it's a system of vessels um, where as the cooler air comes in, the blood um, is, is cooled before it goes to the brain. Um, and as a result of that, it stops the animal's brain from, 
from basically overheating and the animal dying. Um, so yeah, they've made um, an incredible adaptation to these environments. Um, to the point where if you remove them from these environments and you try and put them in other areas, they, they really don't do very well at all. Within the park, there is a small museum detailing the history of this area. Between 1913 and 1917, the present park was surveyed and divided into farms by a Scottish surveyor, Roger Malcolm Duke Jackson, which explains the many Gaelic names of waterholes in the park. After World War I, these farms were made available to white people, and later also to colored people. Only a few families were prepared to settle on these farms, and in 1931, the Minister of Lands, Mr. Piet Grobler, proclaimed the area a national park. Land was purchased south of the park to resettle these farmers. Their houses and other structures were abandoned. So I once again didn't see any big game or anything like that, but Mick, what did you see? We joined the Navy to see the world. And what did we see? We saw the sea. <laughs> I'm joking. We saw uh, two cheetah. Yeah. Mm. We saw wildcat. And we saw uh, secretary birds. Oh, they're playing and everything. And man. what else did we see? Well, they gave you a show. You know, I hate you right now. Derek, I tried to radio you, but you just gone. I didn't know where you were going. Jerenis. <laughs> Fantasy <laughs> restaurant. So you saw a cheetah? Yes. And was it the first time? It's the second time only in my life. The other one was about 25 years ago. But this cheetah leaped in front of the vehicle, ran over the road, and then gave us a whole show. And it had his brother with him. It was so fantastic, such a, such a privilege. Soon after dinner, rain started pouring down in the Khalakhadi, and I was the first on the road the following morning. It's a rainy morning in the Khalakhadi. I feel very privileged to be here, the only one on this road, and I hope I get some good sightings. But if I don't, we had some epic, epic times on this trip. And I want to say a massive thank you to Camera Tech and Photo Rental for giving me these beautiful lenses. You don't need to buy them. You can actually rent them from them. And it's just giving me a beautiful, beautiful, sharp image um, to shoot these environments with. So, a massive shout out to them and hopefully we get some cats.
So now we're going to go just outside of the park to Kalahari Trails. Uh, there is a meerkat sanctuary and it was started by the late Anne Raza, which is a, she was an incredible woman. Um, her son is uh, in charge of the meerkat sanctuary and me and Lorraine are going to go that side and see if we can find the colony and then uh, we're going to learn a bit more about those beautiful little creatures called meerkats. So let's go. Marley van der Berg had two rescue meerkats due for their daily walk and foraging. The other wild groups that frequently visit Kalahari trails were nowhere to be seen, most likely due to the cold weather. My name is Richard Raza Phillips and I'm the son of Professor Anne Raza, who was residing here in Kalahari trails and created uh, Kalahari trails itself and the meerkat sanctuary. So my mother wrote a book, a Mongoose Watch, and it was about mongooses and everything else. But people start to realise that she did know about, I mean, to be honest, my mother is actually quite amazing with all animals. But uh, with the mongooses, uh, she created a sort of legacy. What actually happened is that one day someone brought an injured meerkat to her and she um, fixed it up helped it out, released it, and it was fine, and it carried on with its life. And then came another meerkat, and then another. And eventually the Northern Cape decided to create her, or give her permission to start the meerkat sanctuary. And ever since then, she's continued to do so. So basically what happens is, any meerkat that is a pet, the police have got the right to confiscate it, um, or most likely they get abandoned, and or they're injured and things like that. Um, she was against the trade of making meerkats pets because they are quite adorable when they're young but however when they grow older they get more aggressive because it's a hierarchy system and they're always striving, striving to become the top meerkat of the group and so that starts usually with biting the younger siblings of your children or something like that and that then of course creates animosity and people just throw them out or do whatever but the thing is that's the time when they should really be out in the wild. I mean, meerkats belong in the wild, and that's my personal opinion as well. Meerkats, um, called meerkats in, in English as well, for the most part, otherwise known as surricates, they're a highly social mongoose, basically. They belong to the same family, um, the family Herpestidae, um, as all other mongooses do. Carnivores, um, despite their cute little faces, um, they can actually be really quite ferocious uh, little carnivores. Um, so obviously you belong to the order Carnivora um, and to be part of that order you have to have a very specialised dentition so you have to have something called a carnassial shear um, and that's pretty much the interface between the, the canines and the first molar which allow any carnivore to like shear meat off the bone. So these little guys will live in troops, um, very capable of digging their own burrows um, but also quite happy to move into already dug burrows by things like ground squirrels. They have an interesting society, um, so they'll have an alpha breeding pair. Um, normally they'll have four to five pups um, at a time, but what's interesting is, is that um, it's not the sole duty of the alpha female to raise them. Um, they'll have helpers who will literally babysit them uh, the youngsters while mom goes off to feed and while mom is off feeding she's actually relieved, relieved of guard duty um, so that she gets maximum protein in to be able to um, nurse, nurse the young. Um, otherwise kind of um, the classic pose of a meerkat standing on its back legs with its front little legs up that's typical sentry duty um, and they do that because their major predators are avian um, so things like martial eagles, pelchant and goshawks, um, these kind of birds will swoop down and take them. So they have a whole repertoire of alarm calls um, and they have different alarm calls for terrestrial predators and avian predators. Um, and so the, the job of the, century is, of the sentry is basically to stand up and look around in the landscape um, in order to notify other members that are foraging with their heads down that hang, there's a predator coming, best you die for cover. Um, and when they're foraging throughout their territory, um, they'll have burrows that they can disappear down to, um, you know, five to 10 meters apart. So they're never very far away from cover um, if they need to go into it. Pretty fearless little creatures. 
Um, you know, they'll quite happily try and chase things off that are much bigger than they are. Also capable of um, killing snakes. Um, and also one of their favorite foods out in these places um, are scorpions. And pretty much none of the scorpions that occur in these arid environments um, are friendly. And by that I mean they're not, um, they are part of what we call um, the Buthidae, the family Buthidae. So these are all highly, highly venomous scorpions. Um, and these guys have absolutely no problem eating them. Um, and what's also interesting is the helpers which are raising the youngsters will actually show the youngsters how to remove the sting um, before they eat it um, and stuff. So there's definitely kind of this engagement um, and a, a, almost a, a teaching mechanism. Best thing of anyone to, for people to help, um, not just the meerkat sanctuary, is just don't get meerkats. I mean, I'd gladly close this place down if, it has, if there's no more meerkats having to be um, rehabilitated. That would be great. Um, we could concentrate perhaps on something else, but the thing is, it'd be nice. And all it is, is uh, people, it's supply and demand, isn't it? If someone wants a meerkat, someone else will try and get one for them. And once you start cutting that off and not demanding or wanting any, then you're going to be saving meerkats because they, they um, to catch a meerkat in a hole, Sometimes you put nets and various other things, but sometimes they just drown them out and they just drag them out. So whatever's alive. So you get one or two meerkats while the rest of the group drown and die. So, you know, it's a very harsh reason. You have this little cuddly toy that you think is lovely. And then it, all its group has been killed off just so you can have that little pet for a while, then you, which you eventually will most likely throw away because it will become more aggressive later on when it gets older, especially if it's a female, because they are alpha females. and they will dig up your tiles and damage your house and everything else, you know, and yes, they are fun to look with. They are very um, compatible to the alpha, whoever they are for the house is, but, you know, in the end, most of them just get be discarded. To be perfectly honest, this meerkat sanctuary is situated really well. It's just outside Kalari Transfrontier Park. Uh, it's on the A360 and uh, between two large lodges. Okay, well, they're all well, they've got sort of beautiful restaurants and everything, we're just basically rustic and very down to earth, but it's pure Kalahari here. Um, my mother so loved it here. She saw the magic of it. I get glimpses of it occasionally, you know, sometimes just watching the sunset or just seeing the springbok run past and everything else, or the gemsbok sometimes, as one just over my shoulder sometimes sits just there. And it, it's just amazing. It's lovely to be here. And um, I feel very privileged to be given the opportunity to do that. And in those times, I actually see the magic, magic that my mother must have found because she absolutely adored that she never left her the 20 years. She didn't want to go anywhere. And we strew our ashes on the dunes with a nice memorial and everything else just to get her to the place where she really belongs. And this is it, the Kalahari Desert. It's awesome. We headed out for our last game drive for the trip. This Will of Africa Kalahari journey with our overlanding friends was definitely one for the books and I cannot wait for the next one. Having Lorraine on this trip was also very special and informative. As a conservationist, a question I'm not infrequently asked is why do you keep doing it Lorraine? I mean, you know, everything we hear, everything we read pretty much tells us that things are going down a pretty slippery slope and the powers that be don't seem to be particularly concerned about it. And my response always is that if every person on the planet just made one change to what they do, can you imagine collectively what that change would be? And if I am not part of the change process, then nobody else is going to be. And so through my actions um, and work as an ecologist, a conservationist, if I can influence just a small group of people, that ripple, that ripple spreads outwards. And I don't even remember who told me it um, years ago. There was a story of a guy walking along a beach and there's hundreds of starfish stranded on the beach. And this guy is going and he's picking up this one starfish and he's throwing it back into the ocean, picking up the next one. And somebody comes along and goes, what on earth are you doing? I mean, really? Like, there's hundreds. And the guy's answer was, it made a difference to that one. 
that's what keeps me going. If some people don't continue doing something, then we really don't have a chance. We found a lion by the name of Silver Eye. Um, the lion is very old, it's quite underweight, and I'm sure it can't hunt for itself anymore. Um, one of the park guests actually told us that this used to be a magnificent lion, and it's on its last days. It's quite a hard sight to see, but I just want to revert back to how special these places are, these wild areas that we need to conserve. And we all need to do our part to keep it like that. Um, humans are destroying Earth at a rapid rate and everything is in our hands to save it, be it climate change, be it wilderness areas, be it humans. Um, I think this is the perfect way to to end this tour is to see a lion like that, um, a full life, a beautiful, beautiful male lion. I still think he is beautiful. Um, I'm probably not going to see him again, but um, salute, Silver Eye. Uh, you are magnificent. Thank you so much for watching. Will Janssen, Egan, Kalfein, Frick, Lorraine, uh, Tina, Mick, Christu, thank you so much for joining me on this trip. This was really, really special to me and I can't wait for the next one. If you do like the videos, please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. Once videos get uploaded, you'll get a notification. Thank you so much for watching and uh, stay safe.